Okay, so today is part two of our very mini series on the mission of Cross Point. So our mission statement comes again right from the words of Scripture. We exist to bring about, which we talked about last week, the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, okay? I want you to commit that to memory. Three parts, three phrases, uh, pretty simple, but encapsulates so much. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith. We talked about that. A greenhouse where faith is sown, where faith is grown, and where faith is shown, okay? And so this is what we want to be doing in this place. Now, the reason we want to do this is not to make our name great, to make, make the name of Cross Point great, but to make the name of Christ great for His name's sake. Okay? And we're going to focus on that this morning. So I want us to recognize that what we do is because of the grace of God and it's for the glory of God. We get the grace, we get, excuse me, we get the grace, we get the help, and God gets the glory, right? And so let that be our aim. And so we're going to talk about that today. Next week, we're going to talk about where we do what we do. It happens here for his name's sake, but among the nations, for the nations. And we'll take a look at that next week. So my hope is that from our time together in the word this morning, we, you, will examine our motives so that we avoid making monumental mistakes And that we would fall more in love with Jesus and live to magnify his name. That is where I'm going this morning, okay? So here we are, your and mine and our motivation matters. Now last week I alluded to this passage and we're going to talk about this, okay? So not only what we do matters... But why we do what we do matters as well. And, check this out, matters even more. Now I can say that statement based upon a number of passages, and here is one. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay, you should be familiar with this passage. And we use the second part often in weddings. But the first part is profound, and this section, 1 Corinthians 13, is in the middle of a section where Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and the body of Christ and saying, here's what's most important. We must make sure that the gifts that we are given are used in a motivation out of love of God and love of people. And so it's good for us to examine these things and consider them. So I'm going to read them for us. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 1, and I'm using the ESV version. Now, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So let's think about this person. This is an incredibly gifted person. They have supernatural gifts. They're a gifted communicator, right? They have incredible insight and understanding, even the ability to predict the future. They have amazing faith that sees results in reality. (laughs) Now this person... If this is one person, is an enormously sacrificial giver. I give all that I have. They're even willing to give up their own life. This is an incredible person. And on the outside, we would applaud this person and say, Wow, isn't this incredible? I can't believe the giftedness that you are. 
the knowledge that you have, the sacrifice that you make, both financially and even of your own self. But if these things are done without the motivation of love of God and love of people, they do nothing, they are nothing, they gain nothing. Now this passage should give us pause. And I'm asking you, to ask God to help you to examine why you, why we do what we do. Why is this important? Because if we are using our gifts and ability to bring honor to anything and anyone else, if we're doing it to be recognized, or we're doing it out of obligation, right? Or we're doing it to be whatever else, and we're not being motivated by love, those things count for nothing. We need to pause, and we need to join David in saying, examine my heart, O oh God. Look in my heart. Now, Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Gives us this counsel saying this. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He, Christ, will bring to light what is hidden in darkness. And will expose the motives of people's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. This again is a sobering passage. So in one sense, we may look like it's all happening. And you may be a very gifted person. And each one of us are gifted why can I say that? Because God gives us gifts, right? Each one has a gift and gifts. And we have responsibility and we have a privilege of using those gifts. So we say, yes, use those gifts and engage in those gifts in their various forms. But let us also examine our hearts that when we do it, we're not doing it out of a a motivation to bring glory to anything other than God himself. And he says, you know what? At the end, at the final judgment, not only what we do in the light and in the darkness, not only what is seen externally, but what is motivated internally, all of these things will be come to light and will be examined. That's when we will receive the praise from God. So here's the recommendation. Do what you do in either the light or in the darkness out of a motivation that God would be honored and praised. Because ultimately, if you're seeking praise from God, he will give it to you. And you don't have to make sure that everyone else knows how great you are. John the Baptist, Jesus called him the greatest person born of men. Okay. One of the things I love about John the Baptist is this line. When Jesus was coming on the scene in his ministry, and John was at the pinnacle of his ministry. Right? He said to those who are following him, look, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. He says, he must increase and I must decrease. What a beautiful thing if all Christians had that mentality. Right? 
I think that would help us with clergy abuse. I think that would help us with pride and arrogance. I think that would help us in so much. So my prayer for us is, and it's multiple, but one of them is that we would decrease and that he would increase. And when people think about this place, they would say, not what incredible people are there, but they represent an incredible Christ who is there. That he would be seen in this place. So let this be our prayer from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So whoever, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, that we would do it all for the glory of God. Amen? Let that be your aim. Let that be our aim. So when we talk about, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, that has to do with our motivation. God help us to have our, our hearts full of love for him, our hearts full of love for other people that we'll gladly do what he's gifted and graced us to do so that he would be glorified among all the nations. And this makes sense, right? So your motivation, our motivation matters. And I'm asking God to help us filter these things. I'm asking you to ask God, God, help me to see what's happening. Transform me so that I am doing what I do for the sake of your name. Because if we don't do that, we will end up making monumental mistakes. Okay. And this is a play on words. Okay. I'm going to give us three examples from the Bible of people who made monumental mistakes. That is, they made monuments to themselves. The first example is from the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11. You remember this, right? God told his people, instructed us twice in Adam and also in Noah. Increase in number and fill the earth. Right? Set it. We didn't do it. There was destruction and a restart. Set it. We went out to do it. And we came to a place now called Babel. In which... Those people, our ancestors, said this in the Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. You see what's happening here? God instructed us to go out. But instead of making footprints, we are prone to make monuments. Right? Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's make a tower that reaches to heaven itself. Right? A monumental mistake. Right? We are prone to make these mistakes as well. God shattered them in order to scatter them. And he separated the, the nations. And his will was done. Now he called, as we know the story, special person. And from him, Abraham, a group of people in which the Messiah would come from. And as time went on, they wanted a king. And they wanted to be like the other nations. So God gave his people a king his name was Saul. He was good looking. He was tall. And God empowered him to lead his people. And he instructed this king, go to these people, the Amalekites, and I want you to completely destroy them. Put everything and everyone to the sword. And so Saul followed God's command to a point. He went in and destroyed the things that they didn't want to keep. <laughs> but kept the best things of the land for themselves in rebellion to God. 
And God, in seeing this, regretted that he made Saul king. What? Because he turned back from following the command of God. 1 Samuel chapter 15, you can read that situation there. And these verses are recorded for us. Saul came to Carmel, which is a mount, not a candy, it's a different thing, okay? And behold, he set up a monument, here it is, for himself. And turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. Whole groups of people are bent towards making their name great. And we have to be careful of the same. Leaders, individuals, are bent towards making monumental mistakes and wanting their name to be praised versus following the command and will of God. Now, there's another group, and this is the last example, who had this monumental problem because their motivation was different from and opposed to love of God and love of people. And these were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. Anyone here ever heard of a group called the Pharisees? The Sadducees, the scribes, the learned individuals who knew God. Now you can say, well, there's no Pharisees today. (laughs) There is. Guess which institution can make, the only institution that can make Pharisees? The religious institution. We have to be Careful of this. Jesus' harshest words were not for those who had not heard the message. Jesus' harshest words were for religious leaders. That's scary. Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus rebuking this group of people, these leaders. He gives this scathing review of them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their flatteries okay, broad. And their fringes, right, these prayer fringes, long, right? little flare. And they love the place of honor at feasts, best seats in the synagogue, at church. And they love the greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi, pastor, by others. This is scathing. Here are individuals who should have the Spirit of God. They know better. They have the Scriptures that tell about God's goodness and His glory. That tell about the pride of individuals and how God deals with it. They have it all the time, the responsibility to know God and to make them known. But it has been perverted and twisted so that... They do what they do to be seen by people versus to bring glory to God. Beware, number one, in your own heart. I'm first concerned, not with the Pharisee out here, but the Pharisee in here. God, help us. Be careful out here, but first be careful in here. So this place, this church built upon the foundation of 140 years and of 13 years and of 8 years. 
Let us be a culture in which we love one another. We perfect holiness to be like Christ. We pray for one another. And our motivation is to bring him glory. You can say amen right there. So let's think that way. God, what can I do to give you most glory? God, how can I use what you've given to me to glorify you? In this building and outside of this building. This is not a Sunday morning thing only. It's an everyday thing always. Whatever you do. So our motivation matters. And God help us not to make monumental mistakes. The truth is that whoever exalts himself or herself will be humbled. So you can choose to either humble yourself or have God do it (laughs) for you. And I've been in both places. It's much better if you do it yourself. Just saying, been there, got the t-shirt, have the scars. Need a reminder. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself or herself will be exalted by God. God's praise is far better than any praise that you will receive from any person. You guys are doing good here. You got this amen thing down. This is good. Those of you downstairs, we can hear you too. And upstairs. Now read this about Christ. And this is one of my favorite passages that describes Jesus. Philippians chapter 2. I know we're going all over the place. Describes Christ. And this is what it says. It says, have this mind among yourselves. Okay? This is to us. That we are to think this way. This isn't a description of of Christ, but this is an admonition to us. You, us, we, in this day, in this place, us have this mind among ourselves, which is yours, not that we have to manufacture it in Christ Jesus. So if Christ is in us and we are in him, not only is he working regeneration and his work justification, but we can also have his Mind, God, give us your mind. And here is what's laid out for us. Verse 6. Who? Though he was in the form of God, the highest place did not count equality with God, a thing to be held on to. If anyone has something to hold on to, it's Christ in heaven for all eternity. But he didn't hold on to this. But he emptied himself, gave it up by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the faith. Becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Don't you like that description about Christ? The highest became the lowest and then was elevated to the highest again. We love that story. So may God work that in us. And I want to congratulate the congregations that have come together that says we want to embrace what God has for new. We're not going to. We have a light show, don't we? People are like, what is going on? Okay. Maybe that's a highlight. Maybe they're doing it on purpose. (laughs) Pay attention. To give up names, to embrace a new name so that the name above all names will be exalted in all the earth, right? 
Well done. It says a lot. Saying we want to embrace Christ. My name, our name, these things name don't matter. But to know what name matters? The name of Jesus Christ. So we are here to magnify His name. Magnify His name. To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name. So here's a question. I'm going to rapid fire some of these scripture, uh, scriptures for us. Why should we magnify His name? Because the bread of life. He is the bread of life. Because there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. That's why the name should be exalted. No one's going to be saved in your name. Okay? You might be a great person, but you are not going to save anyone and you cannot save yourself. We magnify his name because there's no other name under heaven given. No other religious name. No other historical figure. No other name given in which we must be saved. So why do we exalt His name? For the salvation of the world. No one's going to get saved in the name of Cross Point, but they will get saved in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right? Come on. So we exalt His name. So if people are asking about you, what's that sign of what's going on there? Tell them about Jesus. <laughs> Let me tell you what Jesus is doing. Let me tell you how He changes hearts and how He melds congregations. Let me tell you What he has done for you. Talk to people about Jesus, right? Magnify his name. This is why we are to pray. Our Father in heaven, are you familiar with this one? Hallowed be thy your name. May your name be magnified. Why? Because there's no other name in which we must be saved. That's the first thing. So we pray, God, may your name be glorified. May people fall more in love with you. May people want to be with you. May people understand who you are. So let's pray that. So why should we magnify his name? Because Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Right? Author, he wrote it. Perfecter, he does it. Why should he be magnified? Because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. Why should we magnify his name? Because Jesus is the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. If you want a good leader, look to Jesus, right? He's not a hired hand. He doesn't do what he did before a paycheck, right? When the going got rough, he's like, oh, good luck. He laid down his life. The good shepherd knows this by name. Lays down his life. Why should we magnify him? Because he is good. Why should we magnify his name? Because his work is perfect. For all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. Why should we magnify His name? Because His work is perfect. Why should we magnify His name? Because His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. 
Is your work perfect? Amen. Your work is perfect? <laughs> None of our work is perfect. <laughs> is your way perfect? No. Guess whose work is perfect? Jesus. Jesus. Guess whose way is perfect? Jesus. So why do we magnify his name? <laughs> because he's perfect. His way, his work. Why do we magnify his name? Because his character is the one who lays down his life. Why do we magnify his name? Because he didn't grab on to glory for himself, but humbled himself and it was obedient to death. <laughs> so that all may be saved in him. Why do we magnify his name? Because there's no one like him. It's the name that is above all name. Every name pales in comparison. Why do we magnify his name? For he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Why do we magnify his name? Because he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For he created all things. And by his will they existed and are created. Why should we magnify his name? Because great and amazing are his deeds. O Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you and you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Don't you love that picture? My hope is that we all will be there on that day, future, in the future, in which we proclaim these things. And all nations will be represented. We magnify his name because he will make all things new. All things new. Doesn't your heart long for things to be made new? There is so much pain in this world. There's disease, there's death, there's discord. There's depression and despondency. There is something of God in us that longs for something new. Knows this isn't right. It's a hope that's in us. And so there is a suffering. And in this world, there is suffering. But he will make all things new. People that we love die. He will make all things new. People are suffering with sickness and disease. He will make all things new. People have been bound to wheelchairs their whole life. He will make all things new. People are bound by sin and shame and despair. Makes all things new. Why do we magnify his name? Because he is worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. He's worthy. My prayer is that you'll fall more in love with Jesus. Let that be your prayer. When you pray for this place, when you pray for Rockford, when you pray for the church, pray for this church, but pray for the church. Pray that we'd fall more in love with Jesus and less in love with ourselves. Pray that we'll see him clearly because when you see him clearer, you magnify him greater. Right? Right? Come on. That should be our prayer. That should be our prayer over Thanksgiving. 
when you may be meeting together with people. <laughs> we'll have to see. Pray for your relatives that they would see him clearly so they will magnify him greatly. Pray that we be motivated, not out of irritation, not of obligation, but out of love. So we exist, Crosspoint exists, right? To bring about the obedience of faith for His name's sake. Among all the nations. What we do matters. Why we do it matters. Where we do it matters. They matter to God. And God invites us to be a part of His story. You're invited. This is where we're going. So let us purify our hearts and test our motives. Let us become more obedient to our faith, to the faith. For the one who we exalt and point to is worthy of All our praise. The honor and the glory among all people everywhere. Because there's no other name under heaven given among men in which we must be saved. So we're going to pray. The musicians can come up and we're going to transition to communion. Now, communion is a memorial, is a place of remembering. And we're told to remember because the monument of Christ Jesus is worth glory. Honor of Him. And so we remember and we're told to remember what He did in the past. We're told to recognize what He's doing in the present And we're told to proclaim these things until he comes, which is future. And so that's why we do this together. That's why we receive this together. This is the renewal of our faith. It is a saying, I believe. I give you glory for what you've done because by grace we're saved through faith. You don't earn it, but it's a gift of God. And we say, we are in. And we say, we believe. And we say, we are connected. So before we receive this together, and I'll read from 1 Corinthians. Examine yourself. And I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to pause and we're going to listen. So let's pray together wherever you are. If you're at home, I'm asking you to pray. It's a holy moment. So God, here we are, your people, gathered in this place and various places. Father, we want to hear from you. We've examined your word this morning. You're here. You know what we've done. But God, I ask right now that our hearts would be open. That you would examine us. God, we ask because of your love, you will bring your refiner's fire to our motives so that you will be glorified to a greater degree in us 
and through us for the nations. Examine my heart, O oh God. Examine our hearts, O oh God. And Father, I repent. We repent. For motivation that is less than obedience and love to you. Forgive me. Forgive us. God, wipe us clean. Father. Fill us with your love, God. To love our enemies, Lord. We love because you first love us. And God, we ask that your name would be hallowed, that your name would be glorified. And Jesus, we remember your name. We remember your sacrifice. We remember your life. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.